What's up, y'all, and welcome to In the Wild. I am your host, Rayshawn, and today we are talking about Values Week, which for those that are familiar with the university know that Augusta University has six core values, and we have some very special guests to kind of help talk a little bit about those values and just how they kind of encompass the university as a whole. So give a big, warm, general welcome to Dr. Shereen Clement and Dr. Simone Hicks. How's it going, y'all? It's going, going well, yeah. going well. <laughs> yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Uh, getting us started, could you both kind of introduce yourselves a little bit and share about your role at Augusta University? I'll go first, I guess. <laughs> so yes, my name is Dr. Shireen Clement. I think everyone just calls me Shireen though. Um, I started at Augusta University in January 2020, actually in the Office of Admissions, and I worked there for about two years until last year. I transitioned to the Office of Multicultural Student Engagement as their Assistant Director, overseeing Multicultural Mentorship Program, African American Male Initiative. And in the summer, I was able to take on the role of serving as the Director for Multicultural mm -hmm. Student Engagement, which has been really awesome. It's been a really fun semester, like learning that role, but also still getting to engage with students. And I really love it. Well, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so am I next? Yeah. All right. So um, Dr. Simone Hicks, Simone Works. I am the Associate Dean of Students here at Augusta University. I've been here for a year, a little over a year now. Um, I came from California where I did similar work. Um, I'm excited to be here. So in my role, I work with the, I chair the care team. So where we um, see students who may have challenges and our goal is to get them connected to supports and resources on campus. Um, we also see it as a case management. So there's not a drop off point, but we try to keep them connected and engaged with them throughout the semester, um, particularly during those high touch points of stress, midterms, holidays. Um, we also oversee the open pause pantry um, where we work to sustain food to meet food insecurity on campus and we are always seeking donations. Um, so outside of that, conduct and all the other fun things, but I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have y'all here. Uh, so Values Week celebrates the university's six core values, which are collegiality, compassion, excellence, inclusivity, integrity, and leadership. I could have gone without reading that because they are tattooed on my brain. <laughs> but uh, from both of your respective areas, could you share how your roles in your uh, areas kind of support the university's core values? Yeah, I think that probably like, every area on campus does something to impact those values. I think a lot of times in multicultural student engagement, we really will harbor on inclusivity because it's like just the most direct link to our office. Um, we've kind of started making our t-shirts say inclusivity in multicultural mm -hmm. student engagement. We have a newsletter now called the Inclusivity. Oh, okay. <laughs> GEA, so if you haven't read it, you should read it. Um, to highlight our events, highlight students, we have student op-eds in there. And all oh, we're doing tea. That. Yeah, like, like tea. tea. Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, like tea. I should have said tea instead of tea. I get it. Uh, okay. But yeah, so that's something that's really important to us. And um, we really try to embody that in everything that we're doing in our programming. So when we have events, like the goal is building that community to make a more inclusive environment on the campus for students, staff, and faculty. Um, and we try to make sure that although we sometimes have events that are specific to building community amongst groups of students, it's all with that goal of making sure everyone feels that they belong on this campus and that their voice matters and that they matter and that they see themselves as like a big me member of our larger Jaguar family. Um, and of course, like I said, every single other one of those values really relates like compassion. You can't be inclusive without being a compassionate person. You can't be collegial also without thinking about inclusivity. But we really, I think as an office, like try to center what we're doing in that idea of inclusivity and we want to do it the best we can and that's excellence so we try to yeah. do we try to do um our best just really furthering that goal and basing what we do around that mission yeah awesome <laughs> that's good um kind of echo on what dr clement said like it's hard to speak about them in isolation mm -hmm. because it almost feels like a domino in fact like mm -hmm. one impacts the other mm -hmm. if one is lacking like if we're not showing compassion what does how does that impact our leadership what does mm -hmm. that say for us as a leader um and how we work together as a team i think coming from the care team um compassion is one um probably i would say i lead with i think all are important but inclusivity and compassion um, because we work with students 
from different backgrounds, different experiences, um, different interactions, and sometimes they just want a space to be heard, right? So it could be that a student is not going to class often, but there could be a reason behind that. And so our goal is to create a safe space for those students uh, to be able to just share what that looks like mm -hmm. and not lead with assumptions. Um, but I think that encompasses every value that we embody to provide an excellent service um, to our students, to our institution, and the greater community. I would add to one thing that I've really enjoyed that I think I experienced specifically at Augusta University and even more so in multicultural student engagement since being here is that idea of like collegiality and how often we prioritize collaborating with different departments to have more of an impact on campus and meeting the needs of students. So like even small things like inviting Dr. Hicks to come to events. Last year, she came to a multicultural mentorship program event. We had like a big water. They make me do it. I love <laughs> <laughs> you were really competitive, like you really got into it. I love it. <laughs> but like having students like be there and see other people that maybe they don't see in their day to day and get to in be introduced to a resource that maybe they were told about, mm -hmm. but it's easy to forget when you get into the um, thick of things. Or even in the spring, African American Male Initiative is collaborating with outdoor recreation and doing a specific day trip to go hiking. And like, how do we, you know, we en enhancing inclusivity, but also like, being collegial in those collaborations and making sure the big impact is that students get to experience all parts of campus in meaningful ways and meet all different people on campus in meaningful mm -hmm. ways because I think it's also very easy at an institution of this size for students to like kind of get plugged in one area and mm -hmm. get siloed in that area mm -hmm. so like how do we how do we as staff and professional staff faculty enhance our collegiality to make sure students are getting exposed to everything I think that's really important and it's not something I'm saying I do specifically. I came into mm -hmm. MSC and that was like the expectation. And so just continuing to further that has been really great. And I think that just helps model the culture that mm -hmm. um, we hope to embody here at Augusta University. But I also think it models for the students because when they see us coming together, mm -hmm. it almost encourages them to build their own community and uplift in the same way. So, Yeah, and I love that sense of collaboration because sometimes students are siloed and they're just like, I just want to, you know, go to my classes and stay within my college. I'm not really worried mm -hmm. about what's happening outside of the academics on campus. And then that collaboration happens and then they see like, oh, these are people that I want to class with. These are people mm -hmm. that, you know, I sat beside, never had a conversation with, but now it sparks that conversation. Yep. And I get to connect a little bit more. So mm -hmm. I'm all about that. Um, could you talk a little bit more about any programs that y'all have to just really uh, support students and kind of embody our core values. Yeah. Do you want to go first? Because oh, with y'all areas, there are so many. So but many. Mm -hmm. go ahead. Okay, I'll go first. I'm like, I think so, they're less problematic. So. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um. So we have some. I would say, some, like we always say, like our larger and smaller programs. And we're not talking about impact. It's really like the size and scale of them. Um. So I think they're all impactful and important. Um. Every year we do the Unity Talent Show, which historically has been during Values Week. It's not this year, but historically it's been during mm -hmm. Values Week. And the Unity Talent Show is just an opportunity for students to come together, but also staff and faculty, because they can do talents, they just can't win prizes, um, come together and show off their talents, especially those talents that are coming from um, maybe unique to their background or their experiences, and be able to share that with our community, compete for a scholarship. And it's just a really fun night to come and kind of see students, sometimes students you maybe never knew had these talents come out of their comfort zone. And I know on the flip side, students getting to see faculty and staff like seeing and things like that. Um, last year, Jessica Cooley did a performance and now everyone, yeah, I mean, that's how I think everyone maybe found out Jessica Cooley could sing. sing. Maybe <laughs> y'all knew before, but I don't think anyone else knew. So it's really fun to kind of see people outside of maybe the confines of an office or a classroom mm -hmm. and celebrate that idea of inclusivity and that all these talents and different backgrounds matter. Um, one cool thing about this year's Unity Talent Show is we're actually bringing in visual art and uh, photography. So students will be able to display that and compete, which I'm really excited because that's a new thing. Um, we have an event series called Being Blank at Augusta University. And to me, that really embodies the idea of um, inclusivity, but also, again, like excellence and compassion. And those events are open to anyone, but they're really specifically for students to come together students of our underrepresented identities learn about resources on campus, learn about the um, student organizations on campus, maybe specific to those identities, and then just really celebrate what they bring to campus. Um, a lot of students get plugged into organizations that way, but also I think it's just fun to come together sometimes, and sometimes we theme those. So last year when we did um, for AAPI Heritage Much, so Asian Pacific Islander, um, 
Heritage Month, we did a being AAPI, but it was actually like a karaoke party. And we talked about how there's so many things in our culture that come from different cultures that we maybe embody, but there's a history to them. And so why you should know that. But then we just got a lot of students to sing and rap. Uh -huh. And it was really, really fun because <laughs> they got to really break down those barriers and meet each mm -hmm. other and build community in that way. Um, I could go on forever about the amount of programs that we have um, that I would say embody that the idea of inclusivity. I will touch on though our mentorship programs. Those are mentorship programs in our office that are really based in student success initiatives and specifically for our underrepresented student identities. And so although you're looking at the idea of inclusivity, you're also looking at excellence and students feeling plugged into campus. And so those programs allow our incoming first year students to get paired with an upper level student who in most cases share an identity with them. And they do things throughout the year, um, fun things, but they also take classes together. So they're all taking inquiry together. They'll take leadership together in the spring. We get to teach those classes to them. And they really are able to come in and kind of, I think, build that strong foundation for their transition to their first year. Even before the start of classes, they're coming in and meeting each other. and so. Those two programs are some of my favorite programs to work with because you get to really see students grow and feel this comfort and this um, confidence about themselves as they're entering college. And that's always really fun to see them first year to then you come back sophomore year and they got it. They, they're ready to go, you know, and so I really enjoy working with those ones. Oh, you made me think about something because from the dean of students perspective, we don't... Um per se, do a lot of programming. We're more of, I see, as a response office mm -hmm. um, in time. So in, whether that's a crisis, whether students are having an issue, whether there's a conduct issue. But what I like about it is having the opportunity to see them leave that way, but leave with that confidence that mm -hmm. Dr. Clement just um, mentioned. So really being able to build and walk with those students through the journey. So one of the things we try to do, because we don't want the narrative that we're just an <laughs> office you come to, you know, when something's not going well, but a preventative um, visibility, right? And so mm -hmm. trying to do more tabling on the porch of the house and things like that to get out there to just create a space where they feel they can just come say hello and they've been doing that. And so um, it feels really good when they come back um, just to say, I'm actually doing well today. And so those are the moments that reminds me of the why and those are the moments that reminds me of why these are our values and our mission here at Augusta mm -hmm. University. Well, this is a little off topic, but very relevant because <laughs> last month we did an episode on some campus ghosts. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hicks, you work in Bellevue Hall and Shereen, you came from <laughs> the Nay House. Yes. Would you like to share the spooky experiences that y'all had really quick? I'll share. Okay. So, um, upon starting here, they mentioned this ghost, but I'm like, mm, you know, <laughs> until one day, this gloomy Tuesday, I don't know if it was Tuesday, but <laughs> <laughs> <Pain scene. laughs> I was um, in the office and my office is upstairs and I thought that people were still downstairs because I heard someone walking up. So I then began to shout everyone's name in the house and no one's responding. So now I think they're like playing a joke on me. So I come out of the office and I don't see anyone. And then they go back downstairs and then they come back upstairs. So oh, wow. there was only one option for me and that was to leave. And so whatever <laughs> was supposed to be finished that day did not happen. But this is a real experience. I've also seen um, actually one of the students seen a, a figure in the basement. Um, oh, go in your basement? No, from the door, the oh. outside door. Yeah. And so you'll walk towards it and then it'll fade away like this. I'm serious. It'll be there and then it'll fade. It'll be there, then it'll fade. This is real. This is that's a real experience. Do you want to share yours? <laughs> yes, I will cl clarify that one. I grew up in Savannah, and so in Savannah, everything is haunted, mm -hmm. and you, ex you just accept that. But in a real sense, in a lot of life, I'm like, I don't believe in ghosts until something spooky is happening. And like, I very much do believe <laughs> in ghosts, but like, I like to posture. Like, oh, I don't even believe yeah, in that. Yeah, that's it's not fine. a thing. <laughs> but then I get spooked out, and I'm like, they're everywhere. Get out. <laughs> but I will say, Dr. Hicks's spooky story was a lot more legitimate because mine is more me blaming a ghost for being clumsy. <laughs> So I did work in Vinay House. Everyone knows it's haunted and it is spooky in there. It's creaky and you never know. But one, I would say gloomy Monday morning, but I don't know if it was gloomy <laughs> or Monday. I was in my office and I had gotten all this stuff to clean up and I was taking it down the stairs and I was maybe just, I don't know if you've ever walked down the back stairs of Binet. Mm. They have the front stairs, which are like carpeted and nice. The back stairs are very steep and I was going down and I slipped and I fell to, to the bottom 
and was screaming. Thankfully, Miss Patty Peabody heard me and came and checked on me. But ever since I have said, oh, the ghost pushed me down the stairs because there's no way it was just me. Like I am a lot more poised than that. <laughs> Everyone knows that about me. I never fall. But yes, I like to say it was the ghost that pushed me. Okay. But I do believe there's a ghost in there. I, I don't want to keep blaming the ghost because sooner or later they'll hear and then they'll probably start following me. <laughs> but yes. But now you work in the JSEC yeah. in the MSC Center. Yes, and there's not a ghost in there as far as I know. <laughs> so that's been great. We could talk about it after the show. Uh -oh. But um, <laughs> could you talk a little bit about the center? Because it's still relatively new to the yeah. JSEC. Yeah, we just celebrated a fifth birthday of the center, like being there and the office kind of being established. So yeah, the MSC Center is, I think, one of the most fun places on campus. My office is, like you said, actually located in the center. So a lot of times I get to be around students and they're cheering and having a great time. Uh, I think sometimes students walk by and they think like, oh, that's a meeting room or something specific, but mm. it's an open space for anyone to come mm. in. Um, so there's couches, there's a table, there's a big TV that sometimes they're like watching YouTube or playing the news, but we also just play music in there. There's lots of card games and other types of games you can play in the center. Um, we have access to some study materials. There's three computers that students can use if they need access to a computer quickly. There is now a mini fridge in oh, the nice. center. Okay. Um, so students at any time can come there. It's in the JSAC, second floor, 209. And again, it's just a place for students to come together, build community. Certain times of the year, people are more st studious in there when it gets to nighttime <laughs> and like things like. But like, mm -hmm. if you go in there any weekday randomly around lunchtime, it is just students in there having fun, talking, playing games. Uh, we started a new initiative this year that I've been really having fun with. And as we're celebrating Cultural Heritage Months, we have specific Spotify playlists that students can collaborate and oh, add to. Nice. So like we have one just MSE Center Mix, which is not specific to a Heritage Month and students can add to it year round. <laughs> it's now like a 16 hour playlist. It's ridiculous. Oh. But right now we're all, we're all celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. And so all the music playing in the center now is from um, Hispanic artists or Spanish speaking artists, but mostly everyone's just adding them from Hispanic artists. And it's been really fun. Everyone's having a great time. We also had this like moment where someone had added a lot of classical music that was by a Hispanic <laughs> composer. So so got very okay. cool and vibey in there, okay. but there's also been lots of bad bunny in there. So, you know, <laughs> back and forth with the vibes, but it's really cool. So every month that we kind of recognize as a university, you will get a different playlist in the center. So keep an eye out for that. We post it on Instagram so you can add music to it collaboratively. I love that. So now it's time to have a little fun with y'all, or, <laughs> or at least I'll have fun. Right. Because I gave y'all the warning that you might be putting the hot seat a little bit. Okay. So... This is what I'm calling the Values Week Challenge, where I'm going to give you some very interesting scenarios, mm -hmm. and I just want you to give your best answer to how you would handle these. Okay. <laughs> so, getting first up uh, to test your sense of collegiality, imagine you are a professor at Augusta University, mm -hmm. and you discover mm -hmm. that one of your colleagues, who was a close friend, has been sharing exam questions with their students before the test. They claim it's to help them succeed and maintain a positive collegial relationship. What would you do in this situation to uphold the value of collegiality while also considering the ethical principles of fairness and academic integrity? That's <laughs> Are they sharing the answers with everyone in their class or just a select students in the class? Let's just say select students. Okay, so that changes it. Why did I ask? I should have assumed. Yeah. I should have gone towards <laughs> the assumption. So to uphold the values... And to, I'm looking at you, <laughs> and, you know, maybe to retain a professional relationship as well. Like I would first go to the source and ask the faculty member why they were doing that action. Because maybe there's something that they have made a choice through a very specific lens of maybe their own pedagogy to make that decision. And so I'd want to understand their reasoning and make sure it's correct. Because maybe I just heard this, you know, on the streets, in the blogs, and it's not correct. <laughs> the the blog. first, in the blog. Maybe you heard it in the tea. In the tea. Maybe it was in the newsletter. <laughs> So maybe I would go first, like confirm that that's what's happening yeah. with the professor. And if so, and there is no reason that it should be happening, maybe I would go to the dean of students office and get their support as they are advocates for students. I and like I that. I love how you gave the benefit of the doubt and then you just transitioned it over to Dr. Hicks. Like, <laughs> well, so, okay, I'm really thinking about this. So the first thing, seriously, I think it's important to go directly to that professor because sometimes it could be misinterpreted. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a, um, a student for some reason that has access to something. I don't know their mm -hmm. accommodations, right? So there could be a reason. So maybe understanding it and colleague to colleague, hey, mm -hmm. you know, I, I heard this was going on. I just wanted to know more about it and I want to let you know this is happening. Mm -hmm. um, 
But we do have a responsibility to ensure that we are giving our students an equitable experience, right? And so um, perhaps we could all consult with the chair or something, but to have a discussion, um, not blame, create a space for them to provide an answer, um, but also like um, <laughs> encourage them to, to, to lead their process and um, talking with their <laughs> supervisor. <laughs> but um, yeah, I do think we have a responsibility um, to have equitable practices in the classroom. All right, so next one, and I want to say this one is like even trickier. Oh, so, no. <laughs> so we're gonna have some fun, keep the fun going. Um, you work at uh, Student Health Services and have access to confidential medical records. A student confides in you about a severe mental health issue, but insists their family must not know. However, someone else believes that informing their family could be crucial for their well-being. How do you balance compassion for the student's privacy, but also for their overall health and safety? And I I want to say, Dr. Hicks, this might be more so in your neck of the woods. I think I do, Cirilla. <laughs> so um, the the first thing is the student safety, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would have to prioritize that. Um, we would first discuss what does, um, how are you feeling? How do you need to be supported? And kind of try to assess what's happening. Um, once it but exceeds beyond my scope, I would try to get them connected with professionals. But I also think it's important um, to be transparent in the student how far I can take confidentiality, right? This is a safe space unless there's threats to harm yourself or others. So um, just being transparent up front has created a balance in that conversation um, and, and let assure them that I'm supporting them. But support for me looks like making sure you have access to all the resources on campus. So then I will take them um, encourage them to go to the appropriate um, source um, to be assessed and just get the help they may or may not need, right? And so my goal is just to get them to the uh, professionals. And if there is an emergency, you know, that we would have to call family, we would explain what that process looks like um, to the student to do the best we can. But it wouldn't be our first go-to based on the, obviously, the situation, mm -hmm. right? Um, because we do have... Um, policies and things that we have to follow to. Shereen, I want to say this is, next one is probably more in your neck of the woods because okay. you did recently graduate. Mm -hmm. Shout uh, out to you. <laughs> yeah, whoop, whoop. Uh, so imagine you are a graduate student and has discovered a significant error in your faculty advisor's groundbreaking research that is about to be published. <laughs> Acknowledging the error could delay the researcher's release oh. and damage their reputation. How do you navigate the situation, striving for excellence in research mm -hmm. while maintaining academic integrity? Yeah. So this is a fun version of things where I am so <laughs> such a good student that I have read and I understand and saw this error. So um, I would, again, though, I would start with the faculty member and let them know because it could just be an oversight. And if it's just an oversight and we can pause on this publishing, I think it's good. And I think as you said, excellence in research does not mean quantity of research. It means quality of research. And it means that our research is doing good in the world. And if, it, if there's errors, it can't do good in the world. So I would go to the faculty member and say, hey, I noticed this error. Do you see the same thing? Talk through what the error is. Because there could be a version of these events where Shireen's statistics understanding is a little <laughs> not right. And maybe there's no error. <laughs> but I'll make sure I talk through that with them and that we kind of come to a decision about maybe what we can do next to ensure that the research is excellent, but excellent holistically, mm. not as excellent in timeline or quantity. I like that. I like that. Um, I guess we can just kind of go back and forth. So you're <laughs> up next. I'm up next. Okay. Uh, you are overseeing a student, organ blah, a student organization that promotes inclusivity and diversity and belonging. A controversial speaker has been invited to campus sparking protests and division among students. Mm -hmm. Some argue that it is essential to protect their freedom of speech, while other feel that the speaker's views are harmful and go against <laughs> these principles. How would you strike a balance between free speech and also providing a safe and inclusive campus environment? You would, huh? Okay. <laughs> um, so I would, I would try to create space to hear both parties' um, feedback on the speaker. I do think it's important that the speakers are vetted. Um, but I also think the voices of our students are important. But I'm also aware that we will likely not 
um, come to the decision that will it please every single one. So I think the first step will be creating a space um, for students to have their voice and be able to articulate how they feel, how they believe this impacts them. And um, maybe I ask, right, how, what does detriment look like for you in this? Like, how does, how does this hurt you if it hurts you? Or, um, because we also want a comfortable environment, but we have to, it's just such a balance because, so I would put everybody in the room, we just gotta talk. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta talk it out. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also think we would have a responsibility as faculty and staff to do some proper vetting and, and understand the why. And I think if we can provide the why of the speaker and the purpose of the speaker tying it to the event, then maybe that um, could support what the students believe, not change it, but maybe it can support our rationale for choosing it. Because I think sometimes we, I know me, I'll speak for myself, um, I'll just hear a name and it could be something I heard in the media and that's my narrative, right? With really mm, me not yeah. even fully knowing what that speaker's really about. And they could be like, well, did you know she did work on this? And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that, right? Mm -hmm. And so creating a space where they understand the purpose and how it ties to the purpose of the event. But Dr. Clement, you probably really do this, so. And <laughs> <laughs> no, I think everything you said was great. And I think to you, something, you said this in an earlier answer, being transparent about like why the decision is made yeah. and like, Sometimes just letting a student know why an action is being taken or what action has mm -hmm. to be taken um, to make sure all parties are respected and feel safe on campus can be the missing link. I think sometimes it's easy, especially when you remove yourself from what it felt like to be a, an undergraduate or mm -hmm. graduate student. And thankfully, like I'm still very much in it, still re reliving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, we, it's easy as you age out to remove yourself from that feeling, and you start to feel like, oh, I, this is just how it is, and you don't provide the why anymore mm -hmm. to students mm -hmm. when they deserve the why just as much as we deserve the why. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just knowing the why can ease anxieties yeah. or ease stress, um, even if the why seems very like like a dumb moment to you because maybe you deal in that all the time. But this is mm -hmm. a learning opportunity and a growth opportunity. So I think remembering as like practitioners, we should always be providing the why to students so we can help them grow and understand like that full system they're operating in as well. I think you made a good point too, Dr. Hicks, about kind of prefacing it with like, hey, the final solution may not please everybody. Mm -hmm. Where like, yeah, we're gonna work our best to make sure that everyone is safe, but at the same time, you may not be happy with what we decide, yeah. and it's okay because we'll have more opportunities for you to engage in different ways Absolutely. and do different things, so yeah, I like that. Um, so that's all the time that we have for for this segment but for those watching stay tuned because we'll be back with a little bit more Hello, my name is Susan Davies and I'm your Vice President for Enrollment and Student Affairs. I'm so delighted that I get to talk with you today about Four to Finish. These are four aspects that we want you to incorporate into your life here at Augusta University in order to be successful. We feel like if you incorporate Four to Finish that you will be happier with your Augusta University experience and that you'll graduate on time. So what is Four to Finish? Number one, engage. We want you to engage both inside and outside of the classroom. Join a club or organization. Speak with your faculty member after class. Engage in undergraduate research. Number two, we want you to make purposeful choices. Make purposeful choices about how you spend your time, about your major, um, and even about who you study with. Make purposeful choices. Three is to develop your academic mindset. We want you to come into college and to be a student here at Augusta University with a growth mindset, with a mindset that allows for you to learn from others and to bounce back easily from mistakes. And number four is to follow your program pathway. This means following your curriculum in order to graduate on time, but it also means thinking about what you want to incorporate into your academic program to make it even more holistic for you. That might include an internship or student leadership. When you graduate from Augusta University, we want you to graduate with your degree in one hand and a career plan in the other. And four to finish will get you there. Welcome back y'all to In the Wild and with us in the studio we have Dr. Clement, I almost said Shireen went by your first name, and we have Dr. Hicks. We are talking about Values Week but uh, switching gears a little bit into more of what y'all do year round to support mm -hmm. students because it's not just Values Week when we come together to do things and I want to say for y'all's neck of the woods y'all stay pretty busy 
the entire year, mm -hmm. um, even in the summer when students aren't here, you're planning and preparing <laughs> for them to come back. So uh, could you talk a little bit about some of the year-round initiatives that y'all do to support students? Okay, so um, <laughs> our primary role and something we really want to prioritize is our open pause pen pantry, overseeing that and sustaining it, right? And so um, food insecurity has increased and um, this is a good problem to have, but sustaining is something that we wanna work on. And so uh, we have a lot of visits for students. We create an open space for them. Uh, the students just have to scan in. We have two locations, so one on the health science campus one on Somerville campus, and so it is free for all enrolled AU students, and we're open Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. Um, we always welcome partnerships, so we've started um, this year. I'm really excited we'll be uh, joining SLE to do some events and some drives and some competitions, so I'm really excited about that. Um, to help sustain because when we're fed, we can perform well, right? Mm -hmm. And so this ties directly into student success. And so uh, we we want to eliminate best as possible that barrier and create that access and maintain that access for students. Um, we also, I oversee the care team. And so that's the campus assessment response and evaluation. I have to sound it out. <laughs> um, team. So essentially it's to be preventative, right? And so we have a care report. And so if a student, staff, community member, friend um, knows a student may be experiencing something or they're not sure, um, they can submit a report to us. It is not an emergency response, but within 24 hours we try to get back with the students. Um, and our goal is to meet with our care case manager. Uh, we have two social work interns as well in the Dean of Students office. And oh, so, nice. yeah, it's really cool. And so our goal is to support them, get them the resources and really tap in, like I said, to those um, points that they um, and ba it can be individual. So some students around midterms, they fall. Some students around um, uh, holidays need more um, support. And so our goal is to provide that increased visibility um, so they know we're here and know what services that we do provide and what all we can do. Um, and essentially we are an advocate for our students, right? And so um, sometimes it's being a voice for them when they don't feel like they have a voice, but also empower them to have that voice. And so more so than anything, our goal is to support the students, to advocate for the students, um, and just to be a hub of um, fulfilling. I feel like we get things left and right and so it's just a lot of different response um, needs for the students but our goal is to be visible and know that they have uh, advocates here at Augusta University for them to be successful in and outside the classroom. I think that's huge and one thing I really love is that sometimes universities can have those types of resources and students don't really know mm -hmm. and how often our students talk about care reports they, they're very aware they know. of them. They're very, <laughs> they know, and it's like, even like our mentors in our program sometimes will be like, this was said, do you think I should do a care report? And we'll talk mm -hmm. through it. So I just really like that there's resources here that not only exist on paper or on a website mm -hmm. so we can say we have them, they're being engaged with in meaningful ways by students and faculty and staff, which just makes me really happy because there's no point of having it if people aren't aware of it and yeah. using it. And yeah, they do. Um, when it comes to us, obviously there's a lot of things and some things I've already mentioned. I guess one thing I'll highlight because it's new and exciting is we have a student advisory board for the first time in multicultural student engagement. That's exciting. Um, our first inaugural group of students, they had their first meeting um, like two weeks ago. It was supposed to be three weeks ago, but then there was a hurricane that actually just resulted in a light sprinkle here. So we canceled <laughs> and rescheduled it, but they uh, all came together and it's been really exciting. We have both undergraduate, graduate, and professional student representation. So we really are being able to be holistic in how we look at our events. And students aren't so much planning the events, but giving us feedback on how we can be more responsive, more that. inclusive in what we do or if there's new things we need to be doing. Um, this group is also going to be planning a listening session in the spring for students to come and be able to offer feedback okay. generally. But they're going to it's going to be like student facilitated. That way, again, it can be the most responsive version of itself um, that students can be talking to students and hearing from each other. And we'll let people apply again. So if you're like, I'm hearing about this and I didn't get to be on the uh, the advisory board, we're going to open applications every spring semester for the following year. Um, and it's called MESA, which is a Spanish word for table. So like, how are we bringing people's voices, opinions, and needs to the table through oh, nice. our office? So we, I'm really enjoying that. And I think that's a... It's, it's the word, Smith, and I'm sorry. Oh, I love it. I'm going to have to shout out. That's Chantre Hogan's. I, <laughs> I speak broken French after speaking I love French for five it. years. I love it. But like she did a really, really good job and really thinking through it. And it's been 
already like I can see how it's going to really change and transform how responsive we're able to be and how inclusive we're able to be as well because you can do all the work you should do as a person to understand and be empathetic to other people's backgrounds and cultures and needs but by bringing all these students to the table in this meaningful way and saying tell us mm -hmm. what you need we're able to bring in other different different experiences different backgrounds that aren't our own um and so it's easy to center yourself in your mm -hmm. own experiences but to intentionally say no we want to value and lift your voice um and the student voice specifically has been i think it's going to be impactful but i already see it being very impactful um and I don't want to harp on all the other things I already said that we do. So that's one that I'm really excited about that is burgeoning. And that's so um, that's so powerful, like, uh, because I think how can we make any decisions without the students mm -hmm. like that? They're they're the why mm -hmm. that we're here. So giving them that voice to mm -hmm. um, be at the table that directly impacts them. Yeah. I absolutely love that. I'm excited to see where that goes. Yeah. yeah I, one of my questions here, I want it to which you already kicked it off of like yeah how do you go about facilitating or figuring out like what do students need and what they're saying on our campus because yeah there are studies there's research there mm -hmm. are conversations happening at a larger level you know throughout the country but you know mm -hmm. Augusta University and our campuses we have our own things going mm -hmm. on so I think that would definitely help mm -hmm. keep all of us informed of yeah this is mm -hmm. what our students are saying this is what they need this is what they're expecting from us. Yeah, what they want to see and how, how they want to be engaged because mm -hmm. it's easy to like make the assumption or I, I think as higher ed professionals, it's very easy to be like, well, at my last institution or at a previous uh -huh. institution, uh -huh. this worked. And yeah. it's like, that could be a great idea, but was it yeah. for that place and not mm -hmm. for this space? Um, but I think too with the students, and it's not every single student at the institution, but a lot of the students who interact with our office a lot feel a unique amount of comfort with letting us know when they think we didn't mm -hmm. hit the mark. <laughs> <laughs> or we could do something better. And sometimes I'm like, You're not shy. <laughs> but, but also after I'm able to sit with it, I'm like, okay, look, look, let's flip it. How do we make it better? How do we become more responsive? Um, we've had some luck with like showing up to student organization meetings and asking. Um, they post them on presence, so I feel like I'm invited to them. So like, hey, mm -hmm. we want to do this, and this like directly impacts this identity group that you know you're a part of in this organization. What do you think of this? Or really. I think we talk a lot about co-creating experiences with students instead of creating experiences for students. Mm -hmm. And so how often we're able to have an event where it's um, Black Student Union and Multicultural Student Engagement is having a Black History Month ball or Multicultural Student Engagement and Lambda is doing National Coming Out Day. And when we're able to do that, those are our best events um, because they're responding to the needs of the student and we're, we're letting them tell us. And I think there's a vested interest in the success when we're co-creating with students instead of telling them what they need mm -hmm. or want. Yeah. I, I think that makes a big difference mm -hmm. to have that buy-in and that just personal investment from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I think they teach me more than they probably know. Seriously, mm -hmm. I learned so much um, from them and I just see myself as a support to them. They're in the driver's seats of their lives and their process. I just fill the gaps every now and then um, to help them with the tools and resources. But I learn so much from them, whether that's sayings, whether that's what they don't <laughs> like, whether that's what they like. And so, um, yeah, I love that. Are there any other ways that y'all use to kind of stay connected with the student population here on campus? Events. I like going to events, probably more than they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I go to a lot of events, do you? Yeah. Like, even if not our own events, I try to show up. I think it's important for students to see us at other people's events. Yeah. Yep. But um, seeing like how they engage and how they, and it's so nice, they'll be like, oh, they're Shereen, like, she's here. Yep. I love going to see students when they are doing something they're excited about yes. too. If they tell me, I'm like, okay, how do I make it happen? Then yes. I get to be there, whether that be like, my team is running out at Welcome Back Bash, or I went to one of our students, he's graduated now, but he had his like um, master's thesis presentation, yeah. and it was about something to do with livers or kidneys and cells, and that's not my thing. Okay. I don't know what they were talking about, to be really honest, but I was there, <laughs> and I got him a card, and I was there, You're and I smart. got to cheer him on, <laughs> yeah. right? and like that also, that matters, that mm -hmm. stuff matters, so I just like to show up for students. Um, outside of those more formal ways, like an advisory mm -hmm. board, or we have feedback surveys, and we, we ask, like, how'd this go? But building genuine relationships by showing up, I think, is the best way, because that is why they feel overly comfortable yes. to tell me when something wasn't good. Mm -hmm. It's because they, they think that I care, and I do care. But how do you show that? I think it's just showing yeah. up when you can. Yeah, and especially when you're always asking for feedback. Mm -hmm. Like, at some point, it will connect, and like, yeah. you want to know what's going yeah. on? Well, yeah. I'll Here tell you, you what I think about it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for some of our newer students on campus who've only been here for, say, a semester or two, mm -hmm. what would you advise them to 
integrate core values, the university's core values into their lives, or mm -hmm. just from y'all's neck of the woods, best, the best advice mm -hmm. you can give them? Well, that's a great question. Oh, that Maybe is a great one. With integrating them, I think sometimes it's really easy to see them and maybe not not everyone's going to memorize the values. Um, not everyone's an orientation leader, an expert orientation yeah. leader. <laughs> but I think that like looking at them and figuring out what they mean to you personally, mm -hmm. it's really easy to be passive about like a couple words that you never have to interact with. But like compassion and inclusivity mean something different to you than it does to me. There might be some base levels of like the definition, right? That as like speakers of the same language mm -hmm. we would have in common. But what does it look like showing up for you in your day to day versus my day to day versus Dr. Hicks? Versus a student, I think if we take a moment to say, okay, what does this look like in my day to day? Like, how do I show up this way? Or how am I not showing up this way? And how can I improve upon that? I think as a way to really work on integrating it into your life, because then it's not just like an idea out in the world, it's, uh, it becomes concrete. So like, how do I become collegial? How do I, and I think about it, like empathy is not one of our core values, but I think it's related to everything we do. Mm. And like, sometimes I know for me, I got this really good advice once. I speak really quickly. So sorry if I've been doing that this whole time. But I'm from upstate New York uh -huh. and we say everything fast. And also when I get excited, mm -hmm. I stop breathing and I got to get it all out before <laughs> I run out of air. But someone once said to me like, oh, I think you would speak a lot slower if you considered it's a, it's a form of empathy to not speak that way. And I was like, oh. Mm. And so now like not, not always and not when I'm very comfortable because my friends and family understand me. But a lot of times I'm like, it's an exercise of empathy to speak slowly when, especially when I'm presenting or talking to someone. And that's really switched the way I look at it. So it's like, taking this kind of like grand concept, but like, what does it look like to do it? And I think that's a way you can really internalize that in a day-to-day. -day. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Drops <laughs> mic. <laughs> um, I would say, gosh, and I don't even know if this will answer the question, but I'm thinking of what advice. I th what I've noticed probably a struggle is just being authentic to who you are. Mm -hmm. And some of that could be not knowing who you are, right? You get to uh, up until you matriculated through school and grades and now you're in college and there's this level of freedom, but there's also access to so many different people from different backgrounds, different experiences. And so you can get caught up in who they are mm -hmm. and lose who you are. So mm -hmm. encouraging students to own who you are, but respect others for who they are. Cause sometimes mm -hmm. when it doesn't align, we could frown up and feel it's wrong or mm -hmm. weird as some would say, right? Um, but it's just who they are, right? And so owning that, maintaining that, but creating a shared space and being respectful to others, right? Mm -hmm. Having that compassion for something. Um, when you don't understand, seek opportunities to learn. Cause sometimes it's out of what we just don't know, right? We're mm -hmm. uncomfortable with what we don't know. Um, so creating that those spaces and just really being the author of your story. Um, Social media impacts how we look at ourselves, how we see ourselves, uh, the timeline we give ourselves to finish school, mm -hmm. right? And it's so impactful. So sticking to who you are, owning your process, owning your path, recognizing this is not a race um, is the advice that I would I would give students that. Um, and, and, and to echo Dr. Clement, like finding out what those values mean to you, because that can look very different. Um, I think of leadership, right? Mm -hmm. A leadership for some is being in the forefront. Um, leadership for others could look very different. And the truth is, there's no one way. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, so when you can tap into that and, and bring um, you into it, mm -hmm. there's nothing better because no one could be a better you than you. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad you pointed some of those things out because I think when I reflect on my freshman year, because I grew up in a very small country town here in Georgia, and I never lived anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so, we are very diverse. I have a large family, so most of my time was spent with my family. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my belief systems and the way I did things were just based on how me and my family operated. Sure. And so then coming to college, it def definitely was a place of discovery because I'm like, oh, y'all do it this way? Mm -hmm. Or y'all do that? Or I've never heard of, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> like what? So yeah, it was like that. Those first couple of semesters mm -hmm. on campus for me was very eye-opening in, mm -hmm. in a good way because I was like, now I do want to meet more people. I want to see how mm -hmm. just how everybody does different yeah. things, and mm -hmm. whether it's from how they just handle their household or from how they handle their careers. Like there's mm -hmm. so much. So mm -hmm. yeah, college is definitely a. Mm -hmm one of the best places for self-discovery. Absolutely. I think trying new things and trying everything, it's such an, 
I really, I feel like when I went to college, I enjoyed my college experience 100%. But sometimes I'm like, and now I'm so far, I'm much older than I was when I was an undergrad. And I'm like, man, I should have done this. Mm -hmm. And I'm, yes. I'm 31. And then sometimes I'm like, oh, you know, I should have been a communications major. And yeah, like, you go. <laughs> why, why did I study abroad? I did not study abroad. It's Me either. Right? That's my biggest and regret. So it's literally because it's not a better, cheaper way to do it. Yeah. Now I'm traveling as an adult. I have to pay for everything. Right. I like, hey, plan everything. It's not fun. Yeah, yeah. it's very, yeah. should have taken advantage. So it's just like, Thinking about when you're making a decision on like, should I join this club or should I go to this event yeah. or this career services workshop? One, you paid you paid for it. Absolutely. I think people should always remember that you paid for it, even though they might say it's free, you paid for it. Mm -hmm. That's your student activity fees go or whatever fee it might be related to. You. But also like imagine like when I'm 30, will I think wish I had done that? Yeah. Or when I'm 40, will I wish? And likely you would have in most cases. Um, so like balance obviously is important, but I think sometimes it's easy to be passive about not doing things because you think you'll have a million opportunities. Yeah. And time moves a lot slower when you're 18, 19, and 20. It doesn't move as slow yes. when, it, when you hit your 30s. But like don't like take advantage of all the stuff that you get uniquely offered to you in college. And there's so yeah. many things that, even like a gym, I pay for the gym now. Outside of, outside of, I pay for it outside of, well, there's just a fee that I yeah. paid once. Should have gone to that gym more. I couldn't tell you where the gym <laughs> was at my undergrad. Well, I, I'm, I have no clue. My group fitness classes, I should have gone to spin. Maybe I would like spin by <laughs> right. now, but I didn't, I didn't do it. So. Right, right. Yeah, once you're past the point of graduation, you do reflect and like, I could have taken advantage of this, this, yeah. and this. Yeah, or at least done it. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you start thinking yeah. about it. And then, well, everybody, you have friends or like siblings who go to college yeah. and you're like, and they're doing that and I I saw my little like my little brothers now in college and I'm like do everything because I seriously yeah. want to do it so yeah and for me because I'm an AU alum I'm always like oh they didn't have this one I'll just do that mm -hmm. <laughs> right you're like what <laughs> y'all yeah. only talking about open pause pantry when I was there okay. now, now look at you um all the times I could have had you know some extra help when I was struggling absolutely <laughs> absolutely because there were some some struggle summers on campus mm -hmm. uh, for me but uh Got another little fun game for y'all. Okay. So this time it's a lot less uh, hot. So you're not <laughs> in the hot seat, so you can have that sigh of relief. But they are still based on the values okay. and some scenarios from some popular TV shows and movies. And I kind of want to get y'all's vibe on something that you liked about this situation and maybe something that could have been handled maybe a little bit differently. So getting started with uh, inclusivity. We're using the movie Hidden Figures. Uh, there's a powerful scene where Katherine Johnson, Dorothy, uh, can't speak, Dorothy Vaughn and Mary uh, Jackson, who were African-American women working in NASA during the early 1960s, mm -hmm. uh, they had to assert their right to use the same restrooms mm -hmm. as some of their white colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, and they literally had to fight for equal treatment. Mm -hmm. So what's something about that moment that you would recommend or maybe think in something else that you think maybe could have been handled differently this is your movie this is my listen <laughs> i i'm probably going to give it a lot here because that movie um i believe is directly why i finished graduate school oh wow i went i went to that movie when a time i didn't believe when at time i was experiencing imposter syndrome like i don't belong here what am i doing they made a mistake and I looked how those women fought. I looked how they ran in the rain to go to the restroom um, with their work. I looked how they were diminished. I looked how they did work and others took responsibility for it. And to see that and to see that level of resiliency, I think I can do it too. So for me, it was the representation. Like, you see, I love this movie. Like, <laughs> it was so powerful and I appreciate that story being told um, and it gave me something to look forward to but also something to continue right mm -hmm. and so like I was while I was adult in graduate school I felt like this inner girl in me saying you can do it mm -hmm. and so that yeah that's my movie. <laughs> I love that thank yeah. you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah and I, I think the idea of if you are witnessing or a part of something that you view to be unjust Mm -hmm. That it is like it's your right and your role to take an action, um, and I think uniquely here at Augusta University, there's lots of resources and people who are here to support students yeah. in our community. And so, knowing those resources, knowing like 
I exist and our office exists. We have an awesome chief diversity officer, my mm -hmm. old boss, Dr. Green, to go to and say, like, this thing is happening and I see it as unjust. Or there's this thing happening and I think it could be improved upon to make this a more equitable and inclusive campus. What does that look like? I think that's really important to come and use those resources and then be able to advocate for what you need. And then we can have all of us, I say just, it's not just yeah. Dr. Green and myself, there's everyone here who can advocate for students and try to make this the best version of Augusta University yeah. that it can be. So I love the idea of people seeing something and saying, no, nope, this is not how it can be and it yeah. can be better. And like, we can always improve. So I think that idea of improvement and looking at situations with that lens is really important. I mean, it's also a way to leave a legacy as a student. Like you leave yeah. this institution better than you found it. I think that's a beautiful thing. And I'm, I, it just makes me happy how to see the students um, advocate and feel so empowered to do mm -hmm. so for the spaces that have been created around mm -hmm. campus, right? Because there has been a time where people weren't able to advocate for themselves mm -hmm. or, or fear of what that'll look like or mm -hmm. retaliation, right? So I appreciate that we're creating a culture that you have a voice here and you matter and we want to hear it. Yeah. Um, I love that. Um, next up is one of my favorites is Akilah and the Bee. And so we're looking at this from an excellent uh, point of view okay. where Akilah Anderson, who is a young black girl from a low income neighborhood, uh, is gearing up to compete in the National Spelling Bee. And in the final scene, uh, she gets to showcase her remarkable spell, uh, spelling skills. And it kind of just notes her dedication throughout the journey, right, of her being mm -hmm. persistent in all of overcoming all of the barriers that she had to get because we know uh, when you come from low income situations, there are many barriers. So uh, what's something from, I guess, that moment that you really enjoyed or mm -hmm. some takeaways from Akilah and the Bee? We love Akilah and the Bee. We love Kiki Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> She's a queen. So yes. um, I would say, I think the idea of being not being ashamed to celebrate accomplishments is a part of excellence. Mm. I think that sometimes, especially when you're experiencing imposter syndrome, <laughs> there's a million other reasons that you can accomplish something, but we feel a lot of times like we're not allowed to celebrate or like I need to put my head down and do the next thing now. And it is good and right to take a pause and celebrate your accomplishments. Mm. And so I think there's lots of ways you can do that. Um, but I just think it's in, in that movie, but also in life taking a moment to breathe and be like, I did that. Mm -hmm. And it can be the smallest thing, but like you should celebrate your wins because they're not always going to be constant and coming mm -hmm. and coming. So like taking that moment to reflect on like how you did a great job and why you did a great job mm -hmm. and sharing that with people around you who also want to celebrate you, um, mm -hmm. I think is really, really important. Uh, if I'm relating it back to like to my role, last year we started multicultural graduations here for the first time. Yeah, and, we did. Yes, and it was, it's really cool. I'm really excited for the next one because um, it's only going to get bigger and better and be a cooler tradition. But again, it's a really specific way for students and families to celebrate these unique accomplishments and maybe the unique barriers or experiences they had to overcome to reach those um, in these meaningful ways. And I mean, graduations are also time celebrating. You want to celebrate every single I cried party, every right? graduation. <laughs> every Doesn't graduation matter what grade cry? level. No, everyone. Oh, every time you just cry. Anyone. Yours, oh. yours, 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 yours. <laughs> My last one, I was really overheated because yeah. those robes are Oof. too big. And I, I couldn't, I was dehydrated. There was yeah. no way to cry. But yeah, I just, I think that idea that sometimes we feel like, especially in our society, that you just go, go, go. If you never mm -hmm. take a moment to celebrate it, what are you going for? That's like, right. Yeah. And sit in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. Because... Um, I wrote, this made me think about when I've traveled to other countries, how slower pace mm. things are. And here we just go, go, go. Because usually here we graduate and what do we do? Think of the next thing, right? And so really taking that opportunity to, to sit in that mm. moment, not dim your light to make others comfortable, but own that this is a moment. It's okay to be proud of yourself, mm. right? And, and not sizing up the accomplishment because nothing is too small, right? Mm. Like, um, whatever that looks like for you, like mm -hmm. celebrating that. And I love to, to sell the culture of celebrating, um, with others because most journeys, um, come with injury sometimes. And that doesn't have to be physical. That can be emotional. You know, that could be, you had a bad day and it impacted you. And so, um, it's something worth to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. Now that, no, I think we're just going to end it right there because it's, I'm feeling, all, uh, I'm feeling the word that you just uh, laid, Dr. Hicks, um, <laughs> because I'll be graduating in May with Let's my go. master's. Yeah, so yes, I'm ready to share my testimony. That's um, right, and seriously, and right? Like, share that because in 
the people you usually think are watching is someone else that you had no clue was watching. Mm -hmm. And they will tell mm -hmm. you, I watched your journey from here to there. Yep. And I'm ready to hear your testimony. Tell it. Because it creates... Um, a gateway for others yeah. to follow. And sharing all parts of it, because sometimes we harp on like, I did it, and not like this is what I went through. So then when someone is trying to follow your steps, they're like, well, when Rayshawn did it, it was just so yes. easy. And it's yeah. like, no, it wasn't. It yeah. wasn't easy for anyone to get through. Yes. But it's like important to have these like, in that celebration sharing, I think sometimes we'll say like, we want this person to come speak and they just share every single great thing that yes. happened to them. And yeah. I'm like, that's so great, but like, what else happened? Yes, Dr. Clinic. <laughs> and like, then you immediately lose that relatability because yeah. it's like, oh, well, I had to come over, overcome this, 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 and yeah. this, and they make it sound so easy. So easy. Yes. Like it wasn't easy. Everyone saw me crying over the last three years. So. <laughs> and it, it makes me think of the, what's the iceberg? Oh, um, yeah, like the, the big you yeah, see yeah. The, like mm -hmm. You see the, the you Tip know, the iceberg. The, yeah. you see the outcome, yeah. but you didn't see the denials, you didn't see the no's, mm -hmm. you didn't see the headaches, you didn't see the loss, you didn't yeah. see the grief. You didn't, I can go on and yeah. on. Mm -hmm. You didn't see what made that up, right? And so mm -hmm. understand that my tears at the end and my happiness is yeah. much more more about the final product mm -hmm. but it was that journey, the journey. Mm -hmm. and so we celebrating over here yeah well thank y'all so much for being here i feel inspired i hope everyone watching feels inspired uh if you're watching and it's Durham values this week make sure you participate in all the events and you learn all about the university's core values and talk or uh, go experience the msc center yeah. uh stop by bellevue hall i'm sure mm -hmm. dr hicks will not interact with the ghosts <laughs> interact with you um, but yeah thank y'all for being here yes thank, thank you for so inviting much. us